Welcome into Cleveland Browns Daily on a Monday. Brought to you by Bally Betta, sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns. Now live in Ohio. Bootsy and the Bishops in Hawaii. Bootsy uh, ran afoul of the law a little bit there. He got... He was put on a little probation temporarily, but he's back now <laughs> and thriving again. So that is very good. We'll keep you updated on everything that's going on there. Nathan's girl alongside Tyvis Powell. What's going on, Tyvis? You know what? Enjoying the off season and seeing yeah. all the great things that the Cleveland Browns are doing and seeing what else is up A B sleeve. I mean, it really feels like and we'll we'll get into more in, in depth on that, but it feels like, you know, we're in a pretty good place right now going into this draft that's I, coming up. I agree with you for the first time in quite some time. You know, everybody's getting impatient. They're like, Oh, we need to maybe we need to improve this and that. And I look at the roster and I'm just like, maybe this is one of those seasons where you look at the season that they had and you you understand that the Browns did a really good job last year of building depth. You know, yep. obviously a lot of injuries took place, but the guys that stepped in were great. So you got a bunch of solid pieces. When your roster is that good, you don't need to go out there and make this big splash move. You just need to make sure everybody gets healthy and you make sure you put everybody in the right position to win games. And I think they got what they need right now. Maybe it's a couple of minor things they can do here and there, but for the sure. most part, their guys are their guys. Yeah, an hour or two, we're definitely going to go in depth here on this Browns roster with you, Tyvis. Get all of your thoughts there, as well as in the second hour at 2 30, you can get your questions in Buckeyes, Browns, NFL, whatever you want to know. Tweet us at Browns underscore daily and you get the chance to hear from, from Buckeye legend Tyvis Powell. Um, some news, the Browns are reportedly bringing back safety Rodney McLeod and reportedly bringing back kicker Cade York. <laughs> Look at that. I like that. You, you listen, when, you think of, when I first seen that, I thought to myself, you know, maybe they're they're a year late behind this. You know, I think that last year, obviously, they gave him every chance during the preseason to try to win that job, and rightfully so. He, they drafted him in the fourth round. They really wanted him to be the yes. kicker of the future, and he won everybody over with the big kick against Carolina a couple of years ago. Yep. But I also think that maybe you should have brought in some veteran presence in there just for that competition aspect. Now, listen, a lot of people, once he left and Dustin Hopkins came in there and did what he did, Dustin Hopkins right now is the kicker. He's won yeah, everybody no out. Yes. K. York is still a guy that they – they drafted, and they still want to do well. Maybe pairing him with Dustin Hopkins and learning a thing or two, putting him in that competition, maybe that makes Cade a better better kicker. Because at the end of the day, he still has a very strong leg. That's still a weapon that nobody else can say they have in this league. Yeah, he's, got, he's incredibly talented, right? And so part of it is kind of the rehabilitation of the mind. Right. There's no doubt that his leg has the skill. He was you know, so good, I think 14 of 18 on 50-yard field goals in college. We all remember that game winner, but – the inconsistency really plagued him, and now he's going to get to be with a guy who's been incredibly consistent right. in Dustin Hopkins. And yeah, you hope that you know you hope Cade York doesn't kick for you in twenty twenty four. Right, you're looking at maybe in twenty twenty five Dustin Hopkins free agent. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Cade York who you drafted. It just happens to be in his fourth year. That's and, all. and then on top of that. Dustin Hopkins figured something out. You know, even with the elements, the winds, He's the cold, he was unbelievable. So maybe he can teach those things to Cade, and Cade can be the kicker of the future. I, I think that's ex exactly what you're hoping, right, yes. is that you get him back here. And then because you drafted Cade York to be your kicker for a long, long time. Yes, you did. And, and he, he, sta he started off well. Like yep, I say, the one see. big kick, 58 yards, nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah, we, nobody will ever forget that moment. That's for sure. Not me. All right, our brackets. Did you do a bracket this year? I didn't. You know what? I'm at peace because I did not do a bracket. Even though I would have picked either UConn or Houston, I'm still at peace. No bread just because no interest? No, because I got busy. I got extremely busy that I never sat down to actually feel. Come on, Tyvis. <laughs> it's like five minutes is all it takes. I figured to myself, listen, I'm picking UConn versus Houston. Now, yep. There it is. If that okay. happens, then I would have won my bracket. Well, right now you're looking – that's looking pretty good for you. you look hey, like all you it took was chance. five minutes for me to screw up mine. See? See, so. that, that right there. And you probably was miserable. You took all your papers, threw them off the desk, shredded the bracket because it was over. I don't want to go through that anymore. I don't even mind it because it's, it's – not reflective of like I know nothing about college basketball <laughs> so it's not like I thought I was smart I just kind of did it and but you, you want see to what be happens pretty good about that. I, used I used to, to right is your is your champion still alive yes yes oh well then you still yes. got a shot at this thing yeah, yeah. absolutely yep I got uh Houston 
I had okay. Houston. Okay, say so okay. I got Houston, and I got in this one actually. I, so I have two brackets. This one I have North Carolina, which is still they're still good. They're looking good, and then the other one I have Houston. So I have two brackets. Well, Houston gave you a scare last night. Survive in advance. Hey, that is what it's about. That's survive in advance. <laughs> I almost turned it off. It was like a minute and a half left. I'm like, oh, they're up 12. You can do, listen, <laughs> Purdue's 106 to 67 win over Utah State counts exactly the same as 100 to 95 over Texas A&M for Houston. To survive in advance. You're going to have to have a game like that, right? You always have uh, at least one game like that in the tournament, I feel like, and, and they survived it. So that was, that was good. I enjoyed watching some of it. Arizona, I was – Watching them, they were out to a big lead. That's my school. That's who I want to win it. Big lead early over Dayton. Dayton came back, and then yeah. Arizona put them away, which was great. Um, yeah, that's that's who I want to win it. That would be that's probably the one school that I could I, name I, a couple people on the team. I like a good underdog story. I love the Oakland over Kentucky, but obviously that legend came to yeah. an end. Yeah, and I think I want. Then I wanted Yale, yeah, but but NC State is still. I, that is, that's a good one. They're an 11. That's yeah. who beat Oakland. Yeah. yeah. The, t- the highest remaining seeds, you've got UConn, San Diego State, 1 5, Houston, Duke, 1 4, Illinois, Iowa State, 2 3, NC State, Marquette, 2 11, Carolina, Alabama is a 1 4, Arizona, Clemson's 2 6, Creighton, Tennessee, 2 3, and Purdue, Gonzaga, 1 5. So, I mean, you got nobody out other than a, you've got a six seed. In Clemson and an 11 seed NC State, everybody else is a top five seed. I'm not rolling with Clemson. No, me neither. Go Arizona. I love that. Let's get right to the Elite Eight, baby. (laughs) I was very happy with that draw. Now, Clemson's done a good job, right? They smoked New Mexico, and then they they beat Baylor pretty handily. Well, they didn't have to come back against Baylor. They did, though. Beat them by eight, though, Uh when it was all said and done. I'm not rolling with Clemson. No, Arizona. Let's go. Bear down. The Wildcats. (laughs) I like it. Give a. So, right now, Griff. Get Griff on them in third. Yeah, he's ahead of AB. Griff, who's Griff's champ? Oh, no one else has it. Arizona. Go ahead, Griff. Get in here. Griff. By the way, I'll, I'll are you on Griff cam? Because I can't see what's going on Not out yet. here. One second. But show people your fresh helmet. I want to hear this. Griff, looking good, brother. Hey, he got a, he got to rip the paper over. Look yeah, at he's got. I like I it. Yeah. No, I got That's Illinois a, winning the national title. Who? Illinois. I got Illinois. A Big Ten school winning? So you need that. You need so the Illinois path for those uh, at home. You need them to beat Iowa State. That's this Thursday night I at like 10.09 p.m. Like Are you going to stay up for that, Griff? Yes, I will. And then you're going to need them to beat the winner of UConn, San Diego State. Most likely, it feels like most likely UConn, right? So that's where you're – that's where you're at. Yeah, I mean, I feel pretty confident. My my final four is still intact right now. Really? Yeah. I got Jeez. Illinois, Houston, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Illinois, You Houston. got UConn losing like that? I do. What about Arizona? Come on, Griff. Look at you. Did, the reason why he's in third. Hold on. Where does he, Arizona's still alive, Gibbe. Where Do you have Arizona winning this round to the Elite Eight? I do, yes. Okay, all right, fine. I'll take that. Look at you. It's his bracket. I'm just curious. He's, he's right about everything, so I just wanted to know if Arizona's got a chance to make it to the Elite Eight. And he said they're, yes. They're playing Clemson, right? Yeah, they're playing Clemson. I yeah. think they'll be okay. I hope so. I'm feeling pretty good about my bracket, considering I don't know a lick about college basketball this year. So, Well, apparently you do. You're beating Andrew Barry. Yeah, I am. <laughs> just by a couple of points. Who's in though. first place? Uh, Some lady in ticketing, I believe. That's how it all. Right. All, that's yeah. how it always goes. The Man. women always do better than the men in this. The good with the brackets. There's no doubt. All right. So me and Gibbe, Uno's 45th. Gibbe, me and you 49th. <laughs> Out of how many? I, there's at least uh, I think there's like 106 brackets. Yeah. So we're, we're in the, the top, top half. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> we're in the top half. Don't do that, y'all. Ch- I, 100. I hate to yeah. tell y'all, I, I got three of my final fours left. Your chances of winning this is over. No, I we're think. not. No, 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 no. no. Done. I was. Listen, it's done. I won it. It would be that would be wonderful, but that wasn't. I didn't do this just so that I could, would win the bracket. Was, well, why do you do it then? So I have a bracket. So I have something to like look at no, and care about no, the games. No, Nathan, where's your competitive spirit? The, I this have is. tremendous competitive spirit, <laughs> You're supposed to but say. I want to have competitive spirit in something that I feel like I have some knowledge and or say over you the should, outcome. You, you know you what I mean? This is did, like you're supposed to do your research. You should yeah, have no. studied assists, how Listen, coaches do in the postseason. You said you didn't have time to even make a bracket. I took. 
five minutes and I, made I two. I literally of them. did five minutes. <laughs> I did I asked five minutes. Uno I made a bunch two of questions, and Malensic yeah. steered me wrong on like three teams. And so I have three me. of my final four left as well. Same. Mm. I lost Baylor last night. So in this that one, rough. I'm confident that I would have done better than 49. I have Arizona, Houston, and Purdue still alive. I have Tennessee. You feel confident? That's, you, <laughs> that's what an outrageous <laughs> comment. That's an outrageous comment to make. How can you even say that? You don't. You don't know. I would have had. I don't even know who I would have had exactly. in the final four. Oh, it's Lexi Norton who's in first. Good for her. Yeah. She knows her stuff. Good She's got her. max 179. Was Griff's her, at max 178. What's her uh, champion? Carolina. The two people ahead of Griff both have Carolina. So right now, if Carolina goes down, Griff, you're yeah, in Illinois good. can somehow keep finding a way to win. You have 33 more possible than AB. AB's probably going to head the wrong direction. You are the top <laughs> he looks person. At me, he just goes, yeah. You're the top person left with Illinois. Jack Heidenthal is top person left with Arizona. Lexi Norton top with Carolina. A.B. the top one currently with Houston. But the person right below him, Gordon Williams, who's in the training department, great Gordo, he's got a higher total left. Um, And then Tyler Harbison is the top guy with Connecticut. Tom Wyatt in ninth is the top one with Purdue, is the only Purdue. They both fill one out. You could not in this one, I don't believe so. So yeah, we're at forty nine. It goes all the way. Can, it goes all the up. way to one hundred three. I got room. To, I got room to move up. Yeah, yeah. Let me see our. I've got Houston, UConn, and I actually picked UConn to win this one. Repeat. So you have one fifty left of the one forty nine. There are people with one forty nine that have one hundred seventy left. I only have one hundred thirty four left. So Gibby, I will let you know that if you're not in first place, you're in last. This That's isn't fair. Talladega That's Nights. Fair, TP. <laughs> But this is strictly for bragging rights because we work in the NFL and we're not allowed to yeah, we can't play do it. for this anything. Is, this is, we're playing for nothing. Stupidity at its finest. Exactly. Playing for nothing. Just I wish I for the joy. I wish I would have did a bracket now. You should have done a bracket. You could have come in here like your boy Bijan. <laughs> Maybe you would have had a perfect yeah, bracket perfect in the first on the first day. <laughs> yeah. Never By the know. way, what did he do the rest of the time? Not good. Nothing. Like, nothing. I mean, it nothing. went like off a cliff, I think. Yeah. But he's still first. The first two days he had a sixteen sixteen. See, this impressive. is my problem. Like Uno told me, McNeese State. Guess what? McNeese didn't make it out of the first round. Yeah. Uh, it, and then then it was my own stupidity. I was like, TCU, they're legit. They're better than everybody thinks, and I'm not buying Purdue. I had TCU winning and going all the way to the Elite Eight. They lost in the first round. Wait, you thought TCU was going to beat Purdue? Yeah. Oh, Why? No, see, no, no, no. See, the thing I have is, no, I have no faith in Purdue. Well, Purdue did that last year with Fairleigh Dickinson. They weren't going to do that again. No, no, no. no. They, I had them losing in the second round. Oh, to okay, TC. okay. I thought this but was the first else, round. But everything thing. else I had was great. Kentucky screwed me up. Kentucky is the one that got me because this is. I had Kentucky, yeah, going going probably, a little bit. I probably would have had Kentucky too, so I can't be mad at that one. Yeah, out to Oakland in the first round. Come on, come on, man. Although that was awesome, Golkey. They became a hero. Yeah, he had a couple of NIL deals, too. I'm sure. He had like two NIL deals after that game. I said, hey, make the money while you can. Yes. Make it That's a cool money. thing, though, right, in sports now, that he can have that moment. He becomes a sensation and – not only he will cap- companies yeah. capitalize on it, but he gets a chance to cash in on it. Yeah, that's what that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Agreed. Even though he's been in the league for like, or college basketball for like six years. Doesn't matter. By the way, I had this conversation this morning with a couple people outside uh, the BA department, smartest people in the building, not named AB or Kevin Stavansky. Um, maybe a few others, Paul D. Podesta. Okay. Um. In my opinion, they're very smart people. They, they, they have equations written on dry erase boards and things that I I, you I don't even know. Like what that, A squared uh, plus B yeah. squared equals C squared. I don't squared. even know what that equals. <laughs> no, what that's that the is. Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> sure. You got great. that one. I think I slept through that entire semester if that's the case. Um, it's for triangles, Gibbe. Sure. Great. All right. C is the hypotenuse. Yeah. I went into radio, so I'd have one radio TV class, or one math class, I should say. Okay. Smart All right. man. All right. What's the point you were trying to make at the beginning of the story? Trying to go Please, back. Have you forgotten? I think I might have. You were talking with the business analytics people. Hey, what, were we t- what were we talking about? And then about? he w- I don't know. Oh, it's oh, your story. We have to eliminate. So I, know what, I know what you. it was. Hold on. I know what it was. <laughs> okay. We've got to eliminate, like, the whole COVID year. Because you get like extra years and extra years. There was a player on a team this weekend 
that has played for four different colleges. Like that should you're be on coming your to an year, end though. Now. This needs to come to an I, end. The I, whole COVID. Well, it was during COVID. He played during COVID. It, this needs to go bye bye. It's I think going that, to. I think that transfer portal thing. Like I think that's the thing that needs to be critiqued the most. I do. That I think you get well, three, especially in football. I think you get three times to transfer without penalty. Like I think that's that's a little bit too many. It used to be you had to sit out a year. Yeah. If you transferred, and it made you think about it. But now they. I don't know. Well, now, and that's why you're seeing so many. I mean, you once you have a guy on your team, you won the recruitment for a year. You have to then re-recruit them every single year to yeah. keep people on your – it's absurd. It is. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it really why do you think is. Saban, Saban's like, yeah, no, not – Yeah, I no don't thanks. blame him. I don't, not doing this. He's not the only one. I feel like he what he did is going to be a bunch of coaches that feel that same way and going to be like, yeah, we got to get out of here. Yes. That's why that guy from uh, Halfley from yeah. Boston College was like, I'm going back to the NFL. Yeah. I don't need this. No, definitely don't need that. All right, so that was fun. So games again Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we'll have our uh, our final four for this tournament. It is it is fun. It's so much coverage. There's it's just there's always a game on. Like no matter what you're doing, I was doing some, you know, chores around the house doing some and running errands and there's just always action. Yeah. But I will tell you this, the best thing that has been done in the coverage of the NCAA tournament is bringing in the T- NBA on TNT, guys. Barkley and Kenny Smith, like Kenny Smith, the night that Kentucky got eliminated. Oh, yeah, Captain Obvious. Captain Obvious. Okay. And then last night, who was the team? When was in- Barkley talking about showering in his uniform? What? I don't so know. So my buddy just sent me his clip. It's from this year's tournament. It's Clark Kellogg. Yeah, so it would have been last night's crew, maybe. So it was, it was Clark Kellogg, Greg Gumbel. Oh, that's Ke- a previous one. Gumbel's Kenny not Smith. doing it this year. Okay, so then it's an old one. Kenny Smith and Charles. And Charles Barkley's talking about when he was a rookie in the league in the NBA, they would fly commercial, which I find it hard to believe, but I guess maybe in the 80s they flew commercial. And if they had played a night game and then flew out the next morning – to go to their next game, he said he had to wash his uniform. Like, they didn't have, like, time or they didn't have a staff that washed the uniforms for him. And so he said that the best way to wash his uniform was he would take a shower back in his hotel room in the uniform and then let it dry. (laughs) And Clark's like, what are you talking about? (laughs) And he's like, take it off, soap it up, wash it in the shower. Like, you don't need to be wearing your uniform to wash it in a shower. And Chuck was like, "No, I thought it was the I thought it was the best way." And like Clark Kelly was losing his mind. Kenny's like, "You're completely insane." Yeah, he, well. this 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 was Barkley last night after the uh, Alabama Grand Canyon game. I want, Barkley, I want to congratulate Alabama University on advancing. That's his dig since you know he's an Auburn guy. Yeah, it was a heck of a game. Grand Canyon, that was the dumbest game of basketball I think I may have ever seen. Like, everyone went one-on-one. They missed how many free throws. I'm not sure what they were doing offensively. I don't think they ran a play the entire second half. That was some of the dumbest basketball I've ever seen from grown college men. Isn't, like, Thunder Dan their coach? Who's the coach of Grand Canyon? It's not Thunder Dan. So, they basically got a bunch of money. This in the They're in the whack. And they became... Like oh, it's Bryce Drew. Bryce Drew. So they became a power basketball powerhouse. They got all this money. They went thirty and five this year. Um, a guy actually from my high school got recruited to play there. I mean, they won their first round game. Yeah. So clearly they're doing something right. But th- he was right, by the way. Barkley was totally right. Well, they only had one dude. They had, he had twenty nine. The rest of them had like six and eight. Well, that's because the rest of them went a combined yeah, I'm looking nine at for now. 34. I'm looking at it just became a giant track meet against Alabama. Well, they went nine for 34 the rest Alabama. of their team. And one guy had 29, and he was only nine of 22. Yeah, well, and he was nine of 16 from the line. Well, they, shot, they, shot, they shot 32% from the floor, 10% from three, and 62% from the line. <laughs> Like, I could do that right now. That's a recipe for disaster. Ten, and I'm old. They made two of 20. Two of 20 from three. They missed 14 free throws. There were 23 of 37 from the line. That's they, yeah, they atrocious. Made, they make them alone. They win the game. Yeah. 
I mean, Alabama wasn't much better. 37 from the floor, but at least 26 from three. They made eight threes. So eight threes, that's 18 points of difference right there on threes. Yeah, that's, that's – you got to get back to the fundamental. That's what's wrong with the game today. Fundamentals, Nathan. That's right. Fundamental. Everybody want to be stiff. Well, and there's there's only one – and there's only one step, and that's for that's for a reason. I sound like the old guy in the room, and you're not. No, not even. I think close. we've established that. Yeah, not even close. Yeah, y'all. You still have half of the life you've currently li- lived to <laughs> add to your current age to be our age. So you're not the old man in the room. Although you're, you are sounding like one very early on. That's good. I think though now I have a question for you. Now that you're you know 30, do you see? the wisdom of what was said about the Atlanta Falcons a year ago when you were in your 20s. Whew. You know, when that when that statement was made a year ago, that right there is – It was the draft, wasn't it, the draft show? Yeah, it was. Well, it, yeah, you know, we it got started it. on CBD yeah. and then continued <laughs> into the, the draft show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like draft week. It was right after Correct. they did just draft. It was just, it's, yeah. It was just amazing how you didn't see it, and I did. I was like – you don't see what's going on here. You like, oh, Titans, they're not serious at all. And then <laughs> one year later, there they make a great move. Tyvis, and, I, I appreciate you, know. you coming coming through on that. <laughs> so what are you saying right now? You're saying that I was wrong a year ago? Yes. They were serious. Yes. So then they What did they what they wasn't they what one game from winning the conference? Tyvis, they fired everybody. Yeah, they did. And then they said, you know what we have <laughs> to do is get a quarterback. They did. Hello. And then that's what they did. Well, now they're serious. For the record, you were you did, and I loved it. You text me you're like, "All right, the Falcons are serious now." Now they're serious. I was like, "Yes, I love it. I love it." You got to have a quarterback. You got to have a quarterback. I I wasn't out on Ritter. I was. I mean, apparently, apparently they are. They're out on Ritter. They're out on Arthur Smith. Yeah, wow, that's good addition by subtraction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Arthur Smith kind of did that to himself. So yeah, way like Jameis because Jameis irritated Arthur Smith to no end in his final moment as a head coach in the National Football League. So that makes me very happy. That made me very happy. Yeah, this has been fun. All right, we'll talk a little bit about the offseason. When we come back, we're going to talk a little about the owners' meetings down in Florida. We had a big trade over the weekend as well. We're going to hear from Trevor. Trevor Sikama is going to join us around 140, the lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus, calling in on the Twisted Tea hotline to go over his three-round mock draft. And then we've got Kevin Stefanski from the owners' meetings, eight minutes of new new coach talk, coach speak. We'll get Tyvis's thoughts on the Browns' free agency, the players they're keeping, uh, and the Browns' defense. And then we'll do a little Ask Tyvis. Tweet us your questions. The Browns underscore daily. Buckeyes, Browns, NFL. What do you want to know? That's what's coming your way. All right, we're back with more Cleveland Browns Daily. Brought to you by Bally Bat on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
All right, welcome back to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Betta, sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio, Nathan Zgura and Tyvis Powell with you here. And Tyvis, we got some news from the NFL owners' meetings in Florida. First up, the NFL Competition Committee unanimously votes to ban the hip drop tackle against the wishes of the NFLPA. Nathan, this, this one got me upset. Like, I am really, really mad about this. Why are you mad about it? Because I, it seems like every year they, they always do things to help the offense but do nothing to help the defense. Fair. And I, maybe it's because I'm a former DV that I'm mad like this, but what do you expect a corner to do who's a buck 85 when they throw the ball to a tight end and he has to go tackle that tight end? How do you think he's supposed to get him down? Like he's got to he's got to wrap him up and he's got to drop his hips. He's just got to drop his weight. Now you telling me you're banning that so they can't do that. So what? He's gonna jump on his back now and get dragged for yards? Like so, this? what do they want to like kind of stand up and hold him until somebody else comes? That, I, I, no, that's still giving up yards. Every inch matters in football. This I is know. a game of inches, so you have to get him down immediately. That's not like I, I don't. I but understand. you can't also tackle him low. I under exactly. I understand that there is injury risk when you do the hip drop. There's guys that drop their hips and guys they that, land on the ankle. Oh, and that's yeah. how we've seen. Like like Mark Andrews. I get all of those things, and, and, I, and I'm here for that. But my job is to stop the carrier by any means necessary. I can't. Like, that's the only way I'm going to be able to do it. So I'll be eager to see what is being taught. Now, don't get me wrong. When I play football, they teach you how to tackle the proper way. You want to use your shoulders. You want to grab a leg, eyes through the thighs, drive for five yards. But not every tackle is going to be made that way. A lot of guys in the NFL is really good at moving moving their legs out of the way. Like a Christian McCaffrey, he jumps out the way and stuff like that. So sometimes you have to grab them by the waist, around the waist, and you have to drop your Especially weight. if they're running around. away from you. Exactly. So I, I, I don't know. It, it, it's it's really putting the defense at a disadvantage, and I'm very frustrated by it. Give a what does it mean that it is banned? I hope you ain't getting ejected. Like what? Yeah, what does that? What does it mean to be banned? I I don't. I'm going off. The NFLPA of, said that they wanted it to be a. They, they went against the the owners went against the NFLPA. That I do know. Yeah, right, because the NFLPA realizes that, hey, we played in this game and we understand like this is the one right. rep. Only here's way what it, here we, here's what I got. Okay, okay, NFL owners have approved a rule proposal to ban the swivel hip drop tackle. The league announced Monday the violation will result in a 15 yard penalty if flagged in games. But Troy Vincent, the NFL's executive vice president, strongly implied last week that this is likely to be enforced similarly to the use of the helmet rule, which typically leads to warning letters and fines in the weeks after a game rather than just flags during the play. Hmm. So, so you gonna get fined? So it might be a fine. Interesting. So the proposal is written to address only a subset of rugby tackling style that has spread around the NFL in recent years. The tackling technique often results in lower body injuries. The rule requires officials to note two actions. If a defender, quote, grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms and also unweights himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body, landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. So it sounds the way that this is written to me that if you – you did a hip drop tackle, but you didn't land on their legs or trap their legs, then that would not be a violation. That's going to be interesting to see because there's been many times I've made a tackle where I've, where you, you know, you do the spin thing. You get them and you spin and you drop your hips. Like an alligator sp- roll? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, okay, I don't know if so, I landed on their legs, but. Well, it's happening very quickly. Yeah. I think people, people are so used to seeing things in slow motion now because of replays. Yeah. That you've been on the field playing. Right. I've been on the sidelines. Yeah. This stuff happens so much faster than you can even get your head around. So my thing about it is I don't think it's going to – like if I was playing today, it wouldn't stop me from doing it because I'm going to get the guy down by any means necessary. Yeah. And if I get fined for it, then I just get fined for it. But like the flag part, if they're getting flagged for it, that's where it's like – So here's <sighs> what – here's what um, – Competition Chairman Rich McKay said on Monday. 
He said, the rule change does not eliminate the hip drop tackle, only the swivel technique that does not get used very often. When it is used, it is incredibly injurious to the runner. The runner is purely defenseless. I've heard defenders say before, and I hear them, hey, you're putting me in a really tough spot. You're saying, I can't hit here, so what do I do? My response has always been, well, you can't do that. That's just because the guy you're hitting is defenseless and has no way to protect himself. So we've got to protect him. You've got to come up with other ways, and you know what they do. Yes, we outlawed the hip drop, but what you, what you may think are the drag from behind where he falls on the leg, that's still a tackle. This is only that tackle where the player is lifting themselves in the air and falling on the legs. So if you lift yourself in the air, you can pull them down as long as you don't fall on their legs. I mean, that makes it a little bit better. At the end of the day, listen. He's trying to say. So. I gotta see. I gotta see the video clip. I got that. When when I'm sure that before uh, they start training camp, every referee is gonna come in. They're gonna show them the video and show them exactly what they're talking about. But right now, when you say hip drop, like I'm just thinking of all the hip drop tackles I've yeah. ever made, and I'm like, you are crazy if you think I'm not about to do that. So. NFL Executive Vice President Jeff Miller said that last year there were 230 instances of the tackling technique occurring during a game. Okay. So if you think about, let's see, there are 32 teams, right? Mm-hmm, 17. And every team plays 17 games, so 32 times 17. So there are 544 games. Mm-hmm. That's probably bad math. Some of them are against it. Anyway. So you're, they're saying it happened not even once every couple of games. So it's a particular. So that means that this is a particular style that they're talking about. So I don't. So, so that's the right math, right? Every team does play 17 games. You have to add it up, however you get there. Yeah. Every t- so there are 544 games played in the National Football League. Yeah, I would. I, I would be. They should drop release a clip of what they're talking about exactly, so people can know what to look for because when you say like oh you talking about the running down and just dropping your weight that's that's still a tackle okay well that's the one i'm talking about the majority of the time hold on maybe my math is wrong let's think about it this way <laughs> there are He's trying to keep i'm trying to figure right. it out so there are, there would be 16 games a week mm-hmm. it numbers go up and down based because you get the extra week but if if every team in the nfl played they there'd be 16 games every week yes they're true for 17 weeks this is the right math so it's 16 times 17. That's how many games are actually played. 272. So it's about almost. So they're saying once once a game, bait, less than once a game, this happens. Okay. Well, then it shouldn't have affected that much. Uh, I guess somebody's just going to get fined a little bit. 15 injuries. So that means there's about one injury from it a week. Yeah. Okay. The NFLPA joined many current and former players in objecting to the proposal. In a statement posted to social media, the NFLPA said the rule would cause confusion among players, coaches, officials, and fans. I'm confused. I now. agree. <laughs> Monday, former player J.J. Watt was among those who expressed displeasure with the owner's vote. Just fast forward to the belts with the flags on them, is what he said. Current players also <laughs> weighed in, including DJ Reader, uh, Darius Slay, and Javon Holland. DJ Reader, these rules are getting crazy out here. Two hand tag better fits the game. It's a lot. There's about to be a lot of missed tackles, said Darius Slay. Breaking news, tackling ban, said Javon Holland. In addition, two other proposals were approved. Teams will receive a third challenge following one successful challenge. Previously, teams had to be successful on two to receive a third. Proposal was submitted by the Detroit Lions and also approved a major foul by the offense will be enforced before a change of possession in situations where there are fouls by both teams. A major foul by the offense will be enforced before a change of possession in situations where there are fouls on both teams. Hmm. A major foul will be enforced by the offense if there's foul ball. Isn't so that it's, offsetting? I'm about to say, so, so there's no offsetting anymore? Is that uh, what you're saying? No, no. I don't know. I don't know what that means exactly. Let's <laughs> see if, maybe there's more explanation here in this I'm article as we like go around. A major foul on both teams. That's an offsetting foul. So it's a, a, you know this one, Gibbe? No? All right, real quickly. Uh, they had not vote to modify the kickoff. However, a vote could still play, take place on Tuesday. The competition proposal of the majority of kicking and return teams downfield to minimize high-speed collisions, and it would also change where they came we'll, out. Uh, we'll hear more from about that with Kevin Stefanski in the 2 o'clock hour from the owners' meetings. He was asked about that. All and, right, and other then, news really quickly. Uh, Squealer head coach Mike Tomlin, that's his word. Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin reiterates that Russell Wilson has the pole position to be their starting quarterback. 
And one move from the weekend, the Chiefs are trading. This has been rumored for so long. It finally yeah. happened. Lejerry Sneed to Tennessee. Secondary for the Titans is impressive, Gibbe. Who's in that secondary? Oh, God, you got to ask me that. You put it in the rundown. I was about to say. Was, oh. Off the top of my head, I don't remember, but who is the other corner? Well, Bayard's gone. Oh, yeah, on. Bayard's got... gone. Caleb Farley? Did they draft, Ca- did they they, draft Caleb they Farley? They had Caleb Farley, but he was... All right, Tennessee by. Titans. Here we go. There, I got Legereus it. Sneed. Okay. Chidobia Wuzie. Oh, I like him. Yep. Chido. Caleb Farley. And the safeties are uh, Amani Hooker and Elijah Molden. And the Nichols, Roger McCreary. They're not bad. I mean, yeah, solid. That's a solid group. It ain't. It's not impressive. If you're giving me the secondary <laughs> for the Titans is dot, 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 impressive... <laughs> I may have heard that over the weekend. Yeah, I there, I'm. I'm also on a tremendous amount of sinus medication for the sinus <laughs> infection I'm currently dealing right, right. with. All right. When we come back, Trevor Sikama is joining us from Pro Football Focus to talk the 2024 NFL Draft. He's got a three-round mock that is out right now. We'll go through that. Tell you who we gave to the Cleveland Browns and why. That's coming up next year. Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet, a sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns. Now live in Ohio.
Don't miss Billy Joel and Rod Stewart together for the first time ever Friday, September the 13th at Cleveland Brown Stadium. Tickets are on sale now. Visit clevelandbrownstadium.com slash Billy and Rod. 2024 for more information. It's Billy Joel and Rod Stewart together for one night only. Tyvis, you got your tickets? I know you do. You don't have to answer that. Of course you do. Of course you do. Because it's one night only. It might never happen again. Never happened before. Will never happen again. Get your tickets right now. All right, time to talk a little draft with Trevor Sikama, the lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus, and he's calling in on the Twisted Tea Hotline, brought to you by Twisted Tea Hard Ice Tea, an official sponsor of the Cleveland Browns. Keep it twisted, Cleveland. Trevor, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, guys, appreciate you having me. All right, obviously for the Browns, the final year, we hope, of not having a first-round pick, so we obviously we won't participate in that. But let me just ask you in general about your mock. What were some of the big kind of – of sticking points or where you thought things got interesting. And I noticed you had a trade early on at number four, the Vikings who got that second first rounder coming up to get JJ McCarthy. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's the talking point of the entire draft, right? What's going to happen in the top five. I I think that we're going to start quarterback, quarterback, quarterback for this draft, whether it's Washington picking it two or new England picking it three. I think no matter what, if one of those two teams trades out, it's only for a team trading in to get a quarterback. So I think that we're, we're going to start the draft at least with three quarterbacks, and then the ultimate question becomes what happens at four and five. I think the Arizona Cardinals, their general manager, Monty Ossenford, he showed last year he's not afraid to do a little bit of wheeling and dealing. You know, they moved back from three to 12 and then from 12 to six to get the guy that they really wanted. And I think he's open for business at number four. I think that Jim Harbaugh, Joe Ortiz, the new, the new regime uh, with the Chargers, they're open for business at number five if one of those teams wants to trade up for a quarterback. And I think that we'll probably get that J.J. McCarthy pick. I believe it's going to be J.J. McCarthy as QB4 somewhere in the top five. So that means four out of the top five picks in this draft feel like they're going to be quarterback. They're just this year specifically too many teams that desperately need one. And so uh, I think that's the biggest sticking point with the draft. And then I think after that, the ripple effect of what happens, right? I think that Minnesota at number 11. I think the Denver Broncos at number 12, the Las Vegas Raiders at number 13. Whichever teams don't end up trading up for a quarterback, what do they do? Do they become big trade-down candidates? Are teams in the early 20s now going to look to trade up for an offensive lineman, a pass rusher, a cornerback, positions that we think could be really valuable right outside of the top 10? So those to me, right, picks four and five, and then 11, 12, and 13, those are the big pinpoints for what I think could happen in this draft that makes it interesting. Just real quick to follow up down at the top and then let Tyvis jump in here. So if the Cardinals at four – they could get Marvin Harrison, and you look at their receiving core, they've got nobody for Kyler Murray really to throw the ball. Trey McBride's been a very nice tight end, but the, the receivers, Michael Wilson, showed some promise as a rookie, but there really isn't a, a star there. Would you be surprised if they if they trade it out, and then I see in your mock, they go on, on defense with the first two picks? Are, are you Would you be surprised if they didn't add to the weapons there, or do you have that going on later on, uh, second and third round? Yeah, so, you know, I have them going wide receiver in the second round, but there's no question about it. You know, it, it, even with a deeper wide receiver class, the guys like Malik Neighbors, guys like Marvin Harrison Jr., Romo Dunes, they, they look better on the depth chart than anybody that you're going to get in the second round. But I do wonder if Arizona is not afraid to have a move like that. Of course, they need a wide receiver, but this team is still in rebuilding mode, right? They're probably It's probably going to take one, maybe two more drafts to really get this roster where you want. So if you have an opportunity to trade down from 4 to 11 and get an extra first-round pick this year, maybe even another extra first-round pick next year for the move, you know, all of a sudden that could be very worth it for them if they're taking their rebuilding into a two-year plan, right? If it's only a one-year plan, if they are trying to slingshot this rebuild and really compete next year, go for a playoff spot, something like that, then, yeah, maybe it's less likely that they move out of four because they do need that high-end wide receiver to help out their passing offense. But if it's a more longer-term view on how you want to rebuild this team, sure, trade down from four to 11. Go with the top defensive players that you can in the first round of this draft because I think that's where the sweet spot is for them. And then next year, really, you could go all in to go get a receiver, whether it's in the draft or in free agency or something like that because for as much as wide receivers that are picked up in the top of the draft, can really help out your football team. There's so many good wide receivers out there in the NFL that they become available quite often. I think more often than we realize, right? You're sitting here with an opportunity where Tyree Kill has moved teams over the last couple of years. Stephon Diggs has moved teams. T. Higgins is, is basically on the block right now. So you always have opportunities 
to maybe go get a star receiver, whether it's in the draft or free agency. And so for Arizona, just because they really need one doesn't mean that you've got to stick it for this year to take one, in my opinion. When I look at this, Trevor, I see that you got Quinion Mitchell as the first DB taken off the board here by Arizona because you got them trading down to 11. Is he the best corner in the draft this year? I, th- I think that he is, and I think the NFL is going to agree on that. It feels like it's either him or Terry on Arnold. It feels like the NFL is really high in the Alabama corner there as well. But when you look at Quinion Mitchell, elite coverage grade in PFF's database over the last two years, and getting an elite coverage grade, very, very difficult thing to do because not only is the baseline of doing your job very difficult as a corner because of all the things that could go wrong, right? We talk about it's, it's almost like baseball. It's a position where you know you're going to fail. You just want to succeed a little bit in the moments that matter most, and that feels like kind of the cornerback play. Quinion Mitchell has back-to-back elite cornerback graded seasons over the last two years, which is extremely impressive. The most forced incompletions of any DB in college football over the last two years. And then really the only question mark that we had about Mitchell going into the offseason was he played cover three a lot, right? They didn't put him in man coverage. They didn't put him in press very much while he was at Toledo. And you wondered, okay, is that just because the rest of the defense isn't really talented enough to play press coverage? Or is it because Quinion isn't comfortable playing press coverage? And he went to the senior bowl and they put him in press coverage a lot. And guess what? He just locked down basically everybody that he went up against. And so you answer that question, you go to the combine, you – reaffirm what a great athlete he is and so the production uh overall with grades the ball production uh now proving that he can play a variety of different coverage assignments and you're checking the athleticism box too it's hard for me to think that a corner is having a better draft season than Quinion Mitchell is and I think he'll be CB1 because of it as we look at the Browns no pick until number 54 in the second round you have Roman Wilson out of Michigan and he would join a pretty crowded room that would have you know, Jerry Judy, Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore, and then a couple of third-round picks, David Bell and Cedric Tillman of the last two seasons. What do you like about Wilson, and do you see that as a guy that would have an impact this year or more somebody who would ascend to being a starter next year when the Browns obviously will have to make some changes in that wide receiver room? Yeah, I think it's probably more of the latter, certainly since the Jerry Judy trade has happened. But I think that Roman Wilson is just a really good wide receiver overall. So, you know, you go into this year, and it's the last year on Elijah Moore's contract. You know, you're hoping – Cedric Tillman really steps up as well and can play that on the line of scrimmage, kind of X alpha receiver that you want in those contested catch red zone situations. So you're hoping that for him. Jerry Judy obviously gets a really great payday, so he's not going anywhere. You're going to utilize him plenty. But for Roman Wilson, he's just a really good receiver. Uh, I think pound for pound, he's a really good blocker as well. There's that slogan in Michigan, hey, no block, no rock, which means if you're not doing what you need to do to help out in the running game, you're not getting on the field and you're not getting thrown the football. But Roman Wilson – over the last two years, got more and more volume because he was willing to do that despite being a smaller player. So really good vertical guy. I think he's got great speed, former track background. His mom was a track star as well in high school. So uh, he's got that DNA to him. And I feel like he would be a great in-the-mix type of a player to allow them to have more of a vertical presence in their offense this upcoming year. And that could blossom into a more versatile role uh, as time goes on, and especially it would give them the flexibility to not have to pay Elijah more if they're kind of on the fence between doing that. So to me, that was more of a depth move and something that I like for a team that, man, when you look at the Browns roster for what feels like the third year in a row, they're good enough to compete. You, they just got to go out and really um, show their stuff, show what they're capable of doing. And I think that Roman Wilson only makes you a better passing offense being able to do that. You know, now that we're in the second round here and I'm looking at some of these wide receivers you got, a lot of people want to know, you know, who's the second round receiver that you have in here that you think goes on to have a a really good NFL career? Man, I think that there could be a handful. You know, we're talking about a really deep wide receiver class and it feels like we we say that every year, but we really mean it this year. I mean, there's just so there's only so many first round pick wide receivers that are going to happen. So you got guys like Roman Wilson, like a Ricky Pearsall from Florida, a Jermaine Burton from Alabama, a Jalen Polk from Washington, Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, Jalen McMillan from Washington is somebody who I think is very underrated in this class just because of the attention that Romo Dunze and Jalen Polk have gotten throughout the rest of the year. I mean, Javon Baker from UCF I think would be a top eight wide receiver in most other draft classes, but it feels like he's wide receiver 14 in this draft class because it's so deep and so there's just a handful of names of really talented players that 
a lot of them are a little bit smaller. You know, I think the only one that I named right there that could probably play that X type of role for you might be Xavier Leggett. But outside of that, you got these these slot guys, these flankers, these off the line of scrimmage, you know, pre snap motion movement players that you get with momentum who can use their leverage and that speed against uh, different types of different types of coverages, different types of defensive backs. I mean, there's just so it's not that these guys are just athletic either. They're smart. You know, it's, it, it's, I think that's the adjective that I would use to describe this wide receiver class is there's so many smart wide receivers who understand how to win at the position in so many ways that are just beyond the athletic abilities that they have. And that's why you have so many guys that you want to give these day two grades on, these second round grades, third round grades, because it's hard to see them really flopping or failing because of how much, how well they understand how to win at the position. So those are a handful of names that, again, I could see somewhere in the second round, somewhere on day two, where I think could be big impact players when we're looking back on it. Speaking of day two, tackle, I think, is a position that the Browns could attack either on the defensive line or just at the tackle position. And you have a guy going 62 to the Ravens, a tackle out of Yale, that I think would be an interesting fit for the Browns. What do you like about him? And is he a guy that, you know, the Browns probably don't need a tackle this year, but I think they're going to need a starting tackle potentially next year. How would he fit in there? Right. Yeah, Kieran Amagaji is the offensive tackle from Yale, who I think that when you watch his level of competition that he goes up against, he absolutely dominates it. And that is what you want to see, right? For somebody who has, you know, they're not playing in a power five, they're not playing in the SEC or anything like that. Like you've got to see these dudes absolutely dominate their level of competition. And to me, Kieran Amagaji looks like a future NFL player playing with all due respect to a lot of guys who aren't going to make it to the NFL. And um, he makes that known with how he plays there. So to me, he's got that tackle guard versatility. I think that he can play tackle. I really do. I think that he's got the measurable, the size, and he's got the foot quickness, that explosiveness, just the overall build to be able to play tackle. But also he's somebody who I think could really succeed and get a starting role in guard as well. So that versatility there to me should make him a second round choice. I, I, if he gets to the third round, I think it's simply because he's, playing at Yale and he's not playing at these bigger conferences but uh, I agree with you I think that he'd be great for him you know I looked at offensive tackle as well going through this mock draft for the Browns because it's something that hey look at what the Philadelphia Eagles have done right they've had a a couple of, of instances where they've had to change things up on the interior but they've been totally fine with that because they're drafting for the future you know they're they're getting this farm system almost this like MLB you know triple a system uh in their trenches and I think all the other teams can kind of take a look at that and, um, and and take something from it when it comes to that strategy. So I would love for the Browns to go with a, with an uh, offensive lineman, either um, at tackle, um, somebody who might be a guard but could also swing at tackle, and, and you mentioned interior defensive line as well. That's, I think, a good investment for him. Well, let's look at your third-round pick for the Cleveland Browns. At 85, you got them getting Cedric Gray from North Carolina. What is it about him at linebacker that you like about him, and how does he fit with the Cleveland Browns? Yeah, I just think specifically just the athleticism overall. You know, he's a little bit more of a traditional linebacker than, say, like JOK was when he was coming into the league. Now, Owusu Koromoa has, has blossomed into just a fantastic second level defender overall. He's got so much versatility, so much speed. You can rely on, on him in so many ways. But you look at the rest of that linebacker group, you bring in Devin Bush, you bring in Jordan Hicks, and it's like, okay, yeah, those are good plug and play guys for this year. Uh, how much are you really thinking that they're going to hold on to future roles for you. And, and Cedric Gray is somebody who I think he's got some nice pop of athleticism when he's on tape. I think he's a little bit inconsistent. But to me, I like him for Cleveland because they don't have a dire linebacker need with those veterans in there right now. But drafting a player like Gray or just taking a chance on another linebacker that could fall to them in the third round – that's something that I, I continue to like that strategy for them again, because it's a lot like the offensive tackle. You might not need one exactly right now, but if you have that developmental prospect there for you, it makes the transition much easier going into a 2025, a 2026 and something like that. Trevor, we certainly appreciate the time. How hard is it or how fun is it to do a three round mock? I mean, the first round, you see a lot of those, when you get three round, you're really kind of, thinking strategically the whole way through is that is that a fun exercise for you no it is it's a ton of fun you know because when you do those first round mocks and daniel jeremiah says this best you know when you do first round mocks you're doing them with with your ears 
right? When you do big boards and rankings, you're doing them with your eyes. You know, you're ranking how yep. you see these players. But mock drafts are often what you are hearing other teams will do. Well, if you get to go in a round two and round three, then you get to put your own kind of personal flavor into it. You get to build a draft strategy for these teams, and you get to say, okay, if they go here, which is what I'm hearing, then this is what I would do in rounds two, rounds three, something like that. So it also, of course, allows me to give a shout-out to some fan bases who love the draft as well who might not have first-round picks uh, like Cleveland Brown fans out there. So love connecting with them as well. So it's a lot of fun when I get to do these three-round mocks. All right, you can check it out at pff.com. Trevor Sikama, the lead draft analyst, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. All right, when we come back on Cleveland Browns Day, we'll kick off hour number two. Potentially with a surprise. If not, we'll hear from the head coach of Cleveland Browns from the owners' meetings, Kevin Stefanski. It's Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Betta, sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns. Now.
All right, welcome back to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Betta, sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio. What a treat, kicking off hour number two with a returning member of the Cleveland Browns, Rodney McLeod. Rodney, welcome back, man. Man, I'm excited to be back. I can tell. I see the smile. <laughs> Let's start with right. How's the arm? How are you feeling? Man, it's good. Things are progressing well. Um, you know, I, I expect to make a full recovery. Um, and honestly, it's been a straightforward uh, procedure. You know, I've gone through ACLs, rotator cuffs, but the, the bicep has been straightforward. It, nothing's ever s- seamless, but for the most part, I'm good. So I feel strong. I'm lifting up my dog. You know, I yeah. brought, br- brought her in with me. Uh, so no issues. So I know how hard that had to be for you getting injured at the end of the, the season last year. But, you know, in talking to guys like Ronnie and DeAnthony, you stayed so involved and so present and added so much behind the scenes that people didn't see. To me, it says so much about who you are as a guy, player, teammate, all of that. What was that experience like for you? And did you get some gratification out of the way you were able to mentor those young guys and a guy like Ronnie and DeAnthony making huge plays down the stretch? Yeah, I think to the first point, the injury, it was devastating uh, for me you know, to you know, work that hard and to, to now – enter into a new locker room, you know, uh, every player prides themselves on availability um, and, and being available for your team and not at the, the, the start of the year, but that, that means from, you know, OTA training camp all the way through to, you know, hopefully the Lombardi. And I fell last year, like I, I let my guys down, mm-hmm, you know, sure. by not finishing. And it, it kind of was an incomplete story for me. Um, and I think everything inside of me, of course, wanted to make that moment about myself. But, you know, as you, you know, evolve and over my time in, in, in the league, you know, I've, because of the way I was brought in and I had great veterans like Corlin Finnegan, Quinn Michael to guide me, to help shape me and make me the player that I am, yeah. I felt I needed to also serve that role in that room um, for some of those young men. And so for me, I couldn't turn my back, right? Like I'm now, I'm not on the field, but I can contribute in a way off the field sure. that's mm-hmm. going to help and, you um, did. and still hopefully get us to where we ultimately want to uh, get to. And yeah, I just poured into those guys. Uh, you know, you talked about a D-Bell, uh, Rocket. Those guys had a, 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 a remarkable year and they excelled. And it was good to see, you know, knowing that a guy like myself, um, you know, was was able to uh, kind of help nurture uh, them. But after I gave them a, a couple of tools, man, they they turned, they <laughs> they took it, they ran with it, and they made it their own. Absolutely. So after having next success with those young guys like that, is coaching in your future <laughs> when you're down playing? <laughs> man, so many people came up to me last year. Like, man, I mean, I, I really could see you coaching. Yeah. But it's it's different. You know, when we talk about. You know, you being a player coach versus a full time coach. Yes. And those responsibilities look completely different. Yes, they do. So I don't I don't want I don't wanna I don't wanna sign off to that right now. Probably. Yeah. I need a shadow opportunity before I step foot in um and put the headset on for real. But uh, you know, it, it gave me a little insight into um just what it takes uh to be a coach and you know, you just appreciate a lot of those men that stand before us mm-hmm. um, and have to do the things that they do in order to prepare us and equip us uh, for Sundays. So when you look at last season, obviously things didn't go the way you planned them to. When you look at this upcoming season, what are some goals that you've already set for yourself that you want looking to accomplish? Because, I mean, you you already won a Super Bowl before. Yeah. You Obviously you came here and it was a new locker room. You had to get the trust in – uh, bond with your new teammates. What are you looking to do this season? Uh, personally, uh, I'm hungry for another Super Bowl. Yes. Uh, you know, once you once you touch uh, that platform one time and you win it, mm-hmm. and you feel uh, everything that comes with it, that's all. That's the standard from here on out. Yeah. And so that's what I'm. That's what I'm chasing. I'm chasing another ring. Um, personally, like I want to get over 20 interceptions in my career. I'm too short. Uh, so that's something that I, I'm looking to do, mm-hmm. uh, which is a huge achievement for me, uh, you know, in my story. And honestly, uh, just just man, as a as a team, uh, really looking to finish off where we where we the way we ended, just with the the momentum. It, it obviously the the ending wasn't 
what we hope for. Sure. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot to build off of of the the energy, the passion, the camaraderie, uh, the the togetherness, the man, everything about it. We were clicking, and so I think if we take that and move forward into this new season uh, with you know new guys on the team, you know we can go far. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking to have a complete year. Uh, I, I think I texted Stefanski. I said, "Man, we left food on the table." Yes, you know yes, I'm hungry. Yeah. Like I left, I left, like we all left food, but I definitely left food on that table, and I and I got to come back for it. And uh, for me, this is this is honestly saying like this is going to be my last lap. You know, whatever happens, happens. But I'm coming for it all, um, and I, I want it. it all. I love, I love it. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we want it. We Boy, want you it got all. Me. Hey, listen, you know I'm about to saying? come out of retirement. You want me to come go. with you? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's go. So you mentioned it for you. I think about your room. You know, Juan was dealing with that calf all year. Grant ended up missing time after having a great year and, yeah. and getting that contract. So there's probably all three of you that year didn't necessarily go the way that you wanted. And for you, you know, you had been healthy for the most part since what 2018. Yeah. So it, I'm sure it was a shock for all of you guys. And Juan had been healthy throughout his career. Grant, obviously, after the initial, you know, Achilles had been healthy his career. Yeah, and I, I you know, you point to, you know, our room that extends over into the whole team. to various rooms yeah. in the whole team. Like, yeah, the storyline last year was, wow, like how are they going to overcome this, this. injury and then this and then this? And we did it every time. Yeah, we stood tall. It'd be nice to see this team yeah. healthy, by the way. And, yes. that's what, and that's what I'm saying. Fully yeah. equipped. Yeah. Fully equipped. Let's yeah. come back and let's and let's see how far we can go. You mentioned being a new guy coming in the locker room, and you know, I've been. This is this will be now my 13th season here. I've seen a lot of locker rooms. I've never seen one like last year, and it felt like, to me, observing you and the respect you had from your teammates, respect to your peers, the coaches, even Coach Banda loved obviously having you in his room and has thrilled your back. But it felt like you had been a Brown for forever, and in many ways, like they were coming into your locker room. <laughs> And I'm, yeah. for real, I mean, yeah. and that was a very unique thing for me to observe with yeah. this team. But there was something special about it. And I think you were very much kind of at the the center of that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with just the, the men uh, that were in that locker room because that's the hardest part about the game is is trust mm-hmm. and building that trust and some of that was already you know what was there it did exist but it, it took a few more pieces just to you know to to link a few more arms together which ultimately made us stronger yep. and you saw a lot of you saw uh that come to life when we were hit with those adverse moments throughout the time because a a, a lot of teams you know, coach told me you're going to face like three crises a year. You just never know what they're going to be. Uh, but it's the foundation that you build to be able to when everything is going wrong. Can you withstand the media, the 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 the, the fans, the the family, maybe even drama and, and, and all of these things looking to pierce that that rock mm-hmm. that you form. And is it is it truly durable? And you're gonna yeah. find out in those moments. And I, I credit uh, Stefanski and the staff for taking us out to Greenbrier because I really felt in that moment that's where we that's where our identity and our uh, togetherness was formed. We well, might get to do in it eight again. days. You might get to do it again. Uh, yeah, Marcus that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not necessarily looking forward to like the conditions, but you're like we did it once. It was great. But I but you have me. I'm I'm a believer now. Yeah. Um. I I truly believe that it removed us from society and our day to day routines and forced us to just commit to ball and commit to one another. Uh, for that span of time, and that and that really paid dividend for us. Yeah, you can when, see it when you watch the playoffs. As obvi- obviously, after we lost to the Texans, and you watch those playoffs, what was something that you learned? You know, from looking at other teams, maybe some other player taught you something. Maybe you looked at your Browns teammates and said, "Hey, we can do this." What was your moment? What was your uh, thoughts as the playoffs was going on? Uh, as I as I watched on the sideline, yeah, I, did, I I felt helpless because again, like I talked about earlier, just availability and, and wanting to be a part. Uh, but I I didn't I didn't see it as necessarily a loss for us. It's just a learning lesson, mm-hmm. right? A lot of uh, what was covered throughout the playoffs 
really just stems to, um, you know, us being making sure that we're fully, you know, equipped for for that for that moment. Yeah. And and honestly, for a lot of guys, it was the first time. Yeah. You know, and and you don't know until you until you experience it what it's really like. Like a lot of guys can try to explain it to you, but you have to live it for yourself. And I know, um, you know, we're going to use that as a learning lesson and say, hey, man, like when we are put in this position again, um, we're going to be fully prepared for everything that's involved. Right. Because it's not only the preparation, but it's the end game moments. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, are you staying, you know, mentally focused? Are you able to still make adjustments? And all of these things are going on in the environment itself. Right is also like chaos chaos and distracting as is. So mm -hmm. um, I just look at it as a learning lesson for us um, and understanding that, you know, we didn't play our best game. We all know that. Um, there were probably a, a lot of reasons why, you, long list, but uh, at the end of the day, we're going to go back uh, and when the next uh, opportunity presents itself, which it will this year, uh, we're going to take it and we're going to run with it. That's why I love it. How, if at all, has Jim Schwartz changed from your first go around in Philly to the guy that I know you were excited to come join here in Cleveland? Not a bit. <laughs> <laughs> not an ounce. Not an ounce of that man has changed. And uh, that's what you have to respect most about Jim is he is always his authentic self. Um, and what you see is what you're going to get. And it's hard for any – a uh, person to come in first year and have the amount of success as he did yeah. um, and really reshape the culture here defensively mm -hmm. um, and not only reshape it, but, man, just get breathe new life into it. He empowered you guys, and too. And empowered us. Yeah. And the one thing I love about him, he, he allows each player to be themselves. Same way I, I spoke about it. He's him, his true self, and he allows guys to – to express their personality on the field, um, the energy. Like, you see it. I mean, you oh, see yeah. G New, like, yeah. all them guys dancing, all the handshakes that we have. It is contagious, and he encourages it. And it's been that way since I, I knew him in Philly. We were the same way. Uh, there's always um, – each year you find something, right, like some sort of I, I identity that you you run with. And, you know, this year you see the D-line, they had their turnover chain and things like that. So it, it's all those little things. And we had a um, – we actually had a dog kennel. So with every turnover, we would bring the ball back, we would put it in the kennel, and we would bring the person up, whoever created the turnover, just to share a quick word or two. Um, and, man, like when we created that, you saw – turnovers just start to add up. It was like three, four, two, three. Like every week we yeah. touching it. <laughs> we getting something. We bringing the ball back. So uh, just having that sort of uh, sort of identity about ourselves, I think, allowed us to to thrive the way we did. And a lot of credit uh, to Jim for orchestrating it. I love that, man. You, I, I miss playing football. <laughs> <laughs> you make me miss it. Uh, last year, at what moment of the season, you know, as the after the Green Bar. What was the moment of the season that happened where you was like, you know what, this team is very special? Yeah, Baltimore Ravens. Really, just like that on the on the road, Baltimore Ravens. Like we went there, we started a game, pick six. Yeah, yeah. like Don't, we remember. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Pick six. I remember, and it was in that moment. And honestly, I think the next series defensively, we gave up like a 50-yard run, you know, down the sideline. Yeah, so the nothing was going right for us mm -hmm. in a game where we needed to win. They beat us at home. Yeah, We now coming in, stepping in today, they home territory, mm -hmm. and we got to handle business. And all I remember is not seeing a guy flinch on the sideline. Like nobody was wavered. Nobody was stressed. Nobody was panicked. And you and you look at that moment like wow, like because of what we've gone through, we're now uh, equipped for this moment. Mm -hmm. We stand, we're we're now poised. We're focusing on the next play, not the previous play, and we're staying together. More importantly, and we're still trusting our coaches and the guys next to us that they're going to do their job for the remainder of this game. 
because those are the only things that are going to get you out of any tough situation. That's right. And so for us to play the way that we did in all phases, because it took every phase to win that game. Mm-hmm. And then credit four for having like a, a man. Yeah. Like yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> like, he came like, out of halftime on some 14, 14, 14, yeah. 14 <laughs> balling. Then defensively, we get a pick six. Great. Yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody was stepping up. Mike Ford with an interception at the end of the half, but like it took every ounce of 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 that Cleveland Browns team to complete the mission. And when I look back on that moment, I said, that's it. Yeah. That's gonna be the one right there. And everybody, a lot of guys are credit that game, you know, to why we continue and like I said, the next the next week we find out that on we Wednesday lost, we lose yeah. our quarterback yeah. and then beat and the I'm Steelers. Te- and then yeah, I'm telling you, like it's that was the moment. That was the aha moment. Like yeah, we we we've arrived. Yeah. So you know, mm-hmm. in Baltimore, the way you kind of walk out, you end up coming down that that thin stair yeah. to the to the buses. And so I was out there, and that was the game when I was like kind of talking to everybody. It was such a euphoric feeling, right? And it felt to me, you know, from guys like you, even talking to Deshaun, like that was the moment, and you guys were like, we could go win the Super Bowl. I'm telling you, like, like that we was, found ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Like who we, you know that that uh, that what's that uh what's the coach uh, Green Danny, what's his uh, De- uh Dennis Green. Dennis Green Dennis right Green. yeah we, they are they, who they we thought we are, are. Yeah. and that's and that's exactly how we felt like man everything we we like we said about ourselves up until this moment like that was it mm-hmm. that was that and is that what fuels the hunger because you guys never got to see that you never got you had the moment and you were ready to run. And then didn't get an opportunity to do that, at least the way that you thought you were going to in that correct, moment. Correct, correct, because all of the pieces weren't in play. And so, you know, now we're saying, look, we, we got all the pieces we need, and we could run the table. Yeah, I remember Deshaun and, even came off that he's like, I'm me again. He's like, Yeah. I'm back. Yeah. We're like back. that was that that was that was a defining moment for us as a team last year. Um, and it's gonna take more of that this year. Yeah. Like, leave no uh, mistake about it. You know, we're not a surprise anymore, right? And the hardest the hardest thing you can do in life is do something the second time. Yeah. And so now that we're going to step step into the stage again, the lights will be shining bright for us because they understand, you know, who we are. Mm-hmm. And we've now uh, formed that identity about ourselves off the work that we did last year. So now – the same work plus some yeah. got to go into this year yeah. in order for us to reach, you know, that top of the mountain that we're seeking. I love it. Yeah, and the division, by the way, they didn't – nobody else took this offseason off. The no, I like, no, I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> I looked at – you know, I'm on social the other day, yeah. and then I scroll, and they're ranking every division, and there we go at number one. Yeah. We're, yeah. At, we're at number one. and But there's, there's nothing that you want more is to say, man, look, we we handle business, you know. We were able to raise that banner in the in the best division of NFL history, or even that year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took hard work and dedication, commitment, everything that comes with it. And uh, it, it, it's no, it's nothing else that you want more. You know, I don't, I don't want anything easy in life. I never had it that way. Me so either. you know what I'm saying? I like I want, I want, I want your best. Uh, that's what that's what brings out my best. So that's Let's what I'm going to expect this year. Well, we are thrilled to have you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fired 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 fired. Fired. <laughs> Yeah, why we got to wait till September, man? I know that you can enjoy your summer. <laughs> you know, you probably got some more vacations lined up. But we're right, so happy to have you back because I think not only for what you bring and the elite play on the field, what you bring to this locker room, the leadership, all of it, the mentality that you were just talking about, the championship mentality, it's huge to have in this building. So we're so happy that you're back. Man, I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so are we. All right, we'll be back with more. I don't know if we're going to – how we're following this up. Know, but right? we'll be back with more Cleveland Browns <laughs> Daily brought to you by Ballybet right after this.
Be a part of one of the most passionate fan bases in the NFL. Join Next Gen STM presented by Ticketmaster, the official wait list of the Cleveland Browns. Being a Next Gen STM is the best chance to become a season ticket member in future seasons. Visit clevelandbrowns.com slash nextgenstm to reserve your spot today. Man, that was good. He got me ready. I'm yeah, like, I know you're ready. Listen, I'm about so I said to, you're ready. Listen, I'm about to lose 15 pounds, and I'm about to make a comeback. Let's go. I got I to gotta be teammates with Rodney. I mean. He, he, listen, he, he – he, ooh, that's a good leader right there. He is incredible. I mean, that was just – it was incredible. And you talked about coach. I mean, he would be a phenomenal coach, but it's great to have a guy who can be a coach and a leader, but also go make plays for you yes. on the football field. And Rodney McLeod certainly can do that. All right. Kevin Stefanski down at the owners meetings in Florida. Here's highlights from his annual meeting with the media. And we'll hear more from coach later on this week. The most recent. You're down. You're back. Yeah. You know, as you saw with Cade, we're excited about him. Uh, it didn't work out, but you never know how this business works. So the ability to bring Cade back into the fold, uh, I, I think it's great for him, for us. Uh, so excited about it. Mike Grable, yeah. adding him to the organization. How long did were those, you know, how you guys kind of into those talks, and what do you hope they kind of get out of Mike? I, I'll let Braves kind of speak for for his perspective. From my perspective, I was we're very excited to get Braves uh, up there. Uh, I can tell you just having him and throwing a, a brown sweatshirt on him was, was a big deal for me. Get the kid back up in the Northeast Ohio. Uh, he's a person that, that I really, uh, I feel really strongly about the person uh, and the coach. And, you know, I've developed a relationship with Raves over the years, uh, Andrew as well. So when he didn't have a head coaching job this last cycle, you know, I, I made sure that he knew that we would love to get him up there uh, in some capacity. So that, that was really the, the begin, beginning of that conversation. Uh, but just having him, we had him up there uh, last week, did a great job. I'm, you know, I'm really, we're, he's a resource. He's a resource for me. He's a resource for Andrew. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very, very excited to have him. Why did you guys feel it was important to reshape the quarterback room? I don't know that reshape the room was the, the goal, uh, Tony. I think it was just always every year looking at what is the, the best way to put that room together. Uh, we're excited about Jameis. You know, I, I think Jameis is a really, really talented young player. Uh, just getting to know him over the course of uh, the last couple weeks. Uh, he, he's a great teammate. He's excited about helping the team. Uh, obviously, able to bring in Tyler Huntley, uh, another young player that we've competed against. So uh, I think it's just a matter of adding some good young players to the room. You and Andrew both said you'd love to have Flacco back. Why, why isn't he back? Well, I would just say with Joe, number one, and we've talked about it, last year was great. Uh, you know, getting to know him, getting him implemented into our team, what he meant, the impact he had, uh, you know, was was special, uh, as, as we talked about. I think every year you have to look at your roster, look at the team, and, and make decisions that you think are right for the football team. We're really excited about Jameis. Uh, he's a talented, talented football player. Uh, I'm excited about his fit with what we're doing, uh, but it, that was really the, the crux of it. The trade for Jerry Jones, mm -hmm. why was that so important? We're excited about adding Jerry to that room. He's a talented, another talented young player. He can win in a variety of ways. We just think if you add good players to, to the complement of, of who you have already, it makes life easier on the other guys as well. So Jerry's a guy that we've spent a lot of time on, both when he was coming out over the past few years as he's maybe been a, a available potentially, so we've done work on him. Uh, really like his skill set, like his ability to separate, like his ability to make plays with the football. Kevin, it sounded like you're uh, actually introducing new language into the offensive playbook also via Ken. Yeah. So will he call plays? Well, I'll start with the language part. You know, we always look at our system. I'm not married to any words, uh, so we're not changing anything just for the sake of changing things. But if there's better terminology to use, if there's better scheme, if there's better uh, coaching points, we're all ears. As it relates to calling plays, that's not something I'm you know, not gonna ready not ready. You'll be the first one to know, Tony. But uh, <laughs> you know. For me, the focus, we're doing so much work in that offensive meeting room right now and, and having so many really good conversations. And, and again, I want to go back. Uh, the, the coaches that we've been able to add, whether it's Andy Dickerson, Roy Svon, Deuce Staley, Tommy Reese, uh, we've, we've added these guys and they've, they've all brought so much to the table, uh, literally and figuratively maybe, but really excited about this. Did you think it was just time after four years to change offensively? 
with, with the 16 coaches and two new quarterbacks? For, for me, you're always trying to get better, Tony, and, and, and sometimes uh, change can be hard. But with what we're doing, I'm really excited about the guys that we brought in. And, and again, because you bring in different perspectives. And uh, the guys that we brought in have, have added a lot already. If the Browns are chosen to play the Eagles in Brazil, what are the advantages and disadvantages of playing in the very first week? Well, I just got off the phone with Mo, and uh, he, he's, he's, he's on top of it. So he'll, he'll let us know. Uh, yeah, he'll let us know if we're playing there. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, as you know, it's, it's us and, and Green Bay, apparently. Uh, we don't know, they don't know, but we'll, we'll play anywhere, Tony. Wherever they tell us, we don't set the schedule. We don't really care. With that long entryway into that first game, is that better than the middle of the season? It's a good question. I, it's, we'll see. Uh, I, I think the travel itself is the same for both teams. So there's not really an advantage or a disadvantage in, in that regard. So um, I'm just waiting to hear, like all of us. Is it better than playing them in the link? I would think any team is, is better playing in a neutral site than playing in, in their home site. But, uh, again, we don't set the schedule. So not a single question yet about defense. Yeah, I'm the way, ready. The way the season ended in Houston, is, is that a shock to the, to the team, the organization? I mean, there have been no changes on defense, and yet the season ended pretty badly defensively. It's a good question, Tony. Obviously, no one was – happy with how it ended and, and we know uh, and we knew in the moment we knew watching the tape we know now that, that we have to play better in, in a moment like that as a team uh, but I don't think it's fair to, to discount the defense in, in total so uh, we played really good defense historic defense at times we know we can play better coach Schwartz is committed to making sure that we play better uh, so those are things that we'll work through so not uh, in no way do you do you not uh, do you minimize that game because it was important and we're disappointed how it ended, but uh, we want to make sure that we learn from an, the entirety of the season as we move forward. What did you, uh, you did make one change on the defensive staff, the defensive line coach. What, uh, you know, what did you kind of see there and, and what are you what are you adding with, with Cesare? Yeah, Jacques is a, uh, a guy that played in this league for a long time. He's really a self-made man. He, he, he to play for as long as he did, coming from where he came. He's got an incredible story. And then he's coached in this scheme for a few years there down in Houston. He, he gets a lot out of his players. So we're, we're excited about adding Jacques to the mix. When it comes to Watson and getting back to his Houston form, do you think it's just a matter of keeping him on the field the I, whole season? I do. More than that? I do. Uh, I've, I've seen it from Deshaun. We've seen it from Deshaun. Don't have to look very far or don't have to look back too far look at that second half versus Baltimore I mean that's that's as gutty a performance as, as it comes and what, what he's able to accomplish on a bad ankle with a, with a bad shoulder uh, just the plays that he's made for us over these years uh, I've seen it from him so yeah of course keeping him healthy keeping him on the field is, is really important and, and he and he wants that too uh, he's, he's so competitive so he's really attacking this rehab so he's ready to go uh, ASAP Yeah, it's the best division football. We know that. We love that about our division. We know how competitive it is. We know that there, every game is going to be a tough game. We have great, you know, I look at the other coaches in this division that are outstanding, great talent along the rosters. So uh, we know that, other t that everybody else is always trying to improve the roster. We're doing the same, but excited about it. All right, that's Browns head coach Kevin Stefanski from the NFL owners meetings down in Florida. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the Browns offseason, get Tyvis' take on some of the things that have happened here with this team, especially on the defensive side of the football. Still got a chance for some mailbag questions all coming your way here. Clean Browns Daily brought to you by Valley Betta, sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio.
All right, welcome back to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Betta, sports betting partner of your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio, Nathan Zagura and Tyvis Powell. All right, Tyvis, let's talk a little about the offseason here. Browns made a lot of moves, both sides of the ball, really bringing back a lot of key pieces on the defensive side. The addition, obviously, of a guy like Jordan Hicks as well, Quentin Jefferson along the defensive line. Two. What did you What did you think about what the uh, the Browns have done, what Andrew Barry and, and Kevin Stefanski and Paul DePodesta have put together? I thought it was a lot of solid moves. I thought they were the right moves. You know, when you think about, like, Zadarius Smith. Yep. Like, this is it. a lot of people weren't high on Zadarius, but this is the thing about Zadarius that I think a lot of people would agree with when he got here he was one of the first people outside of probably Jim Schwartz that challenged Miles Garrett absolutely he like they had a drill I remember when I was watching I think it was during OTAs they had a drill where they were doing get-offs and Miles kind of didn't go all the way and he was like no 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 we're gonna do it again and I was like the first time I seen somebody challenging Miles Garrett and obviously you see Miles going to have this incredible season why? Because he finally had a big brother that was in there pushing him like that, you know, from a leadership standpoint. And then on top of that, we've seen Alex Wright take another step. Yep. And I'm pretty sure Zadarius is probably in his ear getting with him, teaching him how to be successful because maybe Alex Wright looks at Zadarius like, hey, I can be more like you. You know, Miles is a freak. I can't yep. probably do all the things that Miles can do, but I can do some of the things that Zadarius could. So I thought from a leadership standpoint, it was great to bring him in there. I was kind of shocked when they didn't get bring Taki Taki back. I thought he had an unbelievable season yeah, last excellent. year, especially when it came to the passing grade. But the pass coverage, I thought he was he right. Got paid, man. Yeah, he did. Good for him. Yep. But I was kind of shocked. Great for him. I was kind of shocked that he didn't get brought back. But bringing in Jordan Hicks, a guy who's actually from Ohio, I think he went to Lakota West. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so it's nice to have him here. He's been with Jim Swartz. He understands the defense. He has been a captain on the defense before. So you now you have another voice there, and especially at that linebacker position. You want a guy that can command a huddle, and I think he can do that. Uh, as far as the defensive tackles goes, I was – I was p pretty happy with all of them. You know, Shelby, I played with Shelby in Denver, so I knew Shelby was really good. I was happy to see him come back. Yep. Mo Hurst has been very effective. He just – obviously, he dealt with the injury, Injuries. and that kind of yep. messed him up. But I thought he was trending in a really good direction. I, listen, the Browns didn't really need to make a lot happen on the defensive side of the ball. I thought that they were pretty solid there. Even with the depth pieces that they had, they were all really solid. Um, offensively, you know, going to get Jerry Judy. Yep. I mean, I, when I first heard it, I wasn't thrilled by it. But now when I'm sitting here thinking about it, like Jerry Judy is a really good talent. Like giving up a fifth and a sixth for a first-round talent, you take that any day of the week. And I think Jerry Judy is a guy who – has all the potential in the world. You know, he, he's very shifty. He does run really crisp routes. But I think he struggled with not having that quarterback that can get him the ball, you know. So hopefully with Deshaun in this new offense and also being surrounded by other weapons like Amari Cooper, David Njoku, it should free him up and he should have a really good year as well. So I was happy with those, with that move as well. When, when you're a guy like Jerry Judy from South Florida, went to Alabama because – he admired Amari Cooper, and now he's going to get to come play with, with Amari, Amari Cooper. Cooper. How much does that matter? Is that, is that a situation where you look at and say, all right, whatever the best of Jerry Judy is, we're going to get that because he's going to be learning from one of the very best, somebody that he admires and respects immediately. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> it's funny. Now, I did, me and Jerry Judy, our, simula our situations were similar, but Jerry Judy is a much more better football player than I was. He was a much more better talent than me. When I went to Seattle, I chose the reason I chose to go to Seattle was because my idol in college was Cam Chancellor. Mm -hmm. Now, I was never going to be Cam Chancellor, but you telling me I get to learn from my idol? It made my career so much better because I got to be around a guy who's an all-pro. You know, Mark Cooper's might maybe he's not an all pro, but he's at the top of his game. He's For done sure. some amazing things yes. in this NFL. To get that direct one on one relationship and learn from that guy is going to make Jerry Judy a much, much better player because you'll listen to what he's saying and then you'll go out there and you'll do what he's saying and you'll find, like, wow, this is really working. I'm finding a bunch of success in what he's saying and it's going to ultimately make him a better player because yep. the same thing happened to me when I was with Cam Chancellor. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of – that's the thinking there. And, and certainly, guys, an unbelievable talent. Average about nine yards a target for his crew. It's a pretty good number. You get him with a good quarterback, I think he has a chance to be very good. And the Browns obviously 
anticipate that. They gave him a contract extension. Now, the real numbers came out this week. Mm-hmm. Pretty good deal for the Browns Was if he becomes – yeah. A, a solid which they always do a really good two, job yes. of doing it. i mean last year or was it last year or a couple of years ago we but were chief. saying that about chief exactly it's like why are they giving him this contract and now you look forward and you're like oh it was a really good idea for them to do that get ahead of it because they understand listen this is going to be a talented guy we're going to make sure that it works for us and he's going to be really great so let's pay him now and just in case because the numbers is going to go up and we'll have it'll yep. look like a really good deal in a couple of years it certainly is the hope. All right, real quick, we got some questions in here for the for the mailbag for you, and this is one we can uh, we'll answer here from our good friend Bobby. You can have dinner with one of these celebrities: Tiger Woods, The Rock, Larry David, or Taylor Swift. Who are you picking? <laughs> Ooh, I'm picking Larry David. I'm picking. The Rock. That's The Rock has been an idol of mine since I was a kid. You well, know the when Rock's I, the great one. Of when course. I was a kid, I used to when I was in kindergarten, I used to actually write my name as The Rock, and my teacher would always give me the paper because she knew I wrote it. I love it. Yeah. The Rock. <laughs> listen, The Rock <laughs> is the great one. He's unbelievable. Are you in, Are you watching his return to the WWE I, right now? I seen a, I seen it briefly. It's still going. He's back right now in for WrestleMania, and he's been oh, he's better it. than ever. I you need to be watching. Well, I'll be watching tonight. You need to be watching. He'll, <laughs> he's he's so good right now. For me, it'd be Larry David. I'd love to have dinner with. I mean, all of them. Taylor Swift, I might have to choose because my kids would then think I was so. My cool. w- my wife would think I'm like the coolest person yeah, ever. So because I have to bring my kids that. But if it was just me and there was no other implications, I would Larry David. And speaking I of Taylor Swift, you know my Larry. you know my daughter. I was talking to my wife on my drive up here. My daughter was in the background singing Taylor Swift. She's three years old. And she had my wife like snapping the chorus. Like oh, yeah. it was it's unbelievable. There's a whole catalog. <laughs> but when I'm driving around with my kids, we put there's a there's a playlist on Spotify that's the Taylor Swift complete collection. So it's every song, every <laughs> version ever. And we have to put on my car where the like at the very bottom you can swipe it down so that you can't see what song it is. Yeah. And then I have to like guess what song it is. And she's got two hundred and 50 songs let alone the different versions of the 250 songs Ugh. and i have to get it if i get it like right away i get like a full point if i get it like before the course gets going i get like 0.75 and if like the course gets going i get a half and then if i say it after she said the title of the song i get bum kiss so i'm like taylor swift is on constantly in my car I, listen, I happen to like her music, so it's good. Hey, but it's it's good music. It's a challenge, man. I there actually are a lot know, of songs. It's, it's, I actually know more Taylor Swift songs than I thought I did. Yes, and I I bet you even know more than you even think that you know. <laughs> that's because that's pretty. It's wild. a movement. It's it a, is. It's uh, a movement, no doubt. All right, when we come back, so much more to come. Time flies when you're having fun. Nathan Zagura, Tyvis Powell, Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Bet on 8:50 ESPN Cleveland.
All right. Welcome back to Cleveland Browns Daily. Time now for the Griff Fact of the Day. Griff, my question is, is it about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey's beach photos that have the internet a buzz? Not at all. Okay. All right. Fact of the day. Fact of the day. Fact of the day. It's the Griff Fact of the Day. So for today's fun fact of the day, the Oklahoma City Thunder starting five has an average age nearly equivalent to that of the Tar Heels for North Carolina. North wow. Carolina's age, 22.2 years. OKC, 22.6. Wow. Where did you come up with that one, Griff? I think I've read it on ESPN the other day. That's a good one. I like that. All OKC right, there it is. is that young, huh? They are young, yeah. They got shy, right? Isn't yeah. he their best player? Yeah. Chat, shy, Aren't they like Davis. the number one seed in the West? Like I think one or two, they're yeah, up there. They they've been up there this whole year. They're playing some really good basketball. They are for them to be where they are, is actually amazing. By the way, the Bobby Meckling Bobby fact of the day is Bobby cannot do the monkey bars. One Come minute. on, Bobby, one you can do the monkey bars. The monkey bars? He can do the monkey bars. I Tyvis, haven't, I haven't done them in a long time. No, 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 no. Tyvis, it's been an absolute pleasure. Tomorrow on the program, we'll be joined by the voice of the Cleveland Browns, Ooh. Jim Donovan. Ooh. So that'll be fun. In studio, Gibbe? In studio. Ooh, I can finally give him my uh, gift. Oh, baby. Have you not seen no him? No idea. That's yeah. a 30. 30. Have you yeah. not seen him since the last game? No. Oh. No. Well, I'm excited. The one I'm time he's coming, in. he came in when I was out. I mean, we talked a bunch, but no, I haven't got to see him. In person, ever since everything's been so great. Can't wait to give him a, a big hug. Tyvis, it was a pleasure. Always. We'll do it again soon, I am sure. Griff, great job. Gibbe, great job. The next 15, level is next. 15. Thanks for listening to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.